So before we can understand what is a QLDB, we need to understand what is a ledger database and how does it work. So if you know, and you see here that QLDB stands for quantum ledger database. So we must understand what is the ledger database and how does it work. So we can read the statement here, QLDBs are systems of record, supply chain, registrations and banking transactions. So when you look at these terms, you should understand that it is a heavyweight database that needs the highest level of accuracy and audit. But I won't confuse you here by talking random stuff just like that. So just keep this statement in mind and let's move on. So the name of the database is Quantum Ledger Database. Leave the quantum part for now. Let's talk about ledger. So a ledger is a book or collection of accounts in which account transactions are recorded. So ledgers are typically used to record a history of economics and financial activity in an organization. So think of a ledger as a record. Imagine a banking scenario where people make a lot of transactions. So in a transaction, there might be multiple parties involved who have an account in the bank. There are millions and millions of transactions that take place within a very short time. But with these many transactions, there will be a few concerns. Like how safe are your transactions? How safe are your records? How fast can you keep track of the transactions? And what happens if the data gets deleted? How are you going to track it? And that is why you need a robust database solution. And that's why Ledger is the talking point here. So that is why we need to talk about a database that can help us with this scenario. And that's where we need to talk about QLDB, that is Quantum Ledger Database. So let's see how good is QLDB. So Amazon QLDB is a fully managed ledger database that provides a transparent, immutable and, and cryptographically verifiable transaction log owned by a central trusted authority. And you must be thinking, okay, it's transparent. So it means that we can audit and find the sequence of the transaction and its history and it is immutable. So it means that the data that you have on the database cannot be changed and cryptographically verifiable would mean that we might be using a hashing algorithm to verify each transaction. And if you are thinking on these lines, then you are 90% correct here. And we will get to this. Don't worry. But it's not that we are only going to use QLDB for banking transactions. Ledger databases serve a lot of data. So it could be your banking transaction. It could be your uh, insurance. It could be huge manufacturing inventory. It could be finances. It could be a simple car seller portal also. I know most of you might be thinking why this word quantum is being used here. So let's read this statement here. So a transaction can be in one of many possible states. Which one is unknown until fixed by observation. So one of the many possible states that we have for a transaction is only known when it is fixed by observation. And that is what we will find out today. And once we are done with the session on QLDB, you will have the answer to this. So the most important point that you need to understand is that companies build applications like ledger like functionality because they want to maintain an accurate history of their applications data. So let's suppose you're providing or let's suppose you're provisioning credit card and debit cards or if you are giving loans to firms and you have a huge record of data that needs to be preserved accurately. So if you want to imagine all the use cases of where ledger can be used, just think of scenarios where you want to preserve the sequence of the data that has been stored. So if you take the example of supply chain, a supply chain has multiple stages, isn't it? Like procurement, manufacturing, warehouse and transport. And all these are stages of the product flow. And anyone who tampers with the state of the data at any of these stages might lead to a bigger problem. So there might be a counter argument of using relational databases, but data is way easier to manipulate and it is prone to human errors in relational databases. Because if someone pushes the incorrect transaction, and yes, there is a provision to roll back, but in a huge transactional scenario that could lead to errors, which would not be traceable. And that is why it is rightly mentioned here, relational databases are not inherently immutable and any unintended changes to the data are hard to track and verify. And some of you might say that, hey, we can use blockchains as well. So yes, of course, we can make use of blockchains as ledgers, but wouldn't it be too costly and complex to set up? Yes, that's why let's just keep ourselves to QLDB for now. 
and that is why with QLDB it is more feasible to handle this situation because with QLDB your data change history is immutable so be assured that it cannot be altered or deleted and in order to verify the data modification and change verification QLDB uses cryptography to ensure that the data changes are being tracked even if they are modified so QLDB also makes use of journal which we will discuss in a bit which helps it to have an immutable transaction log it also has the streaming capability for a near real-time flow of your data stored within QLDB so that it can be used with other services when it comes to deployment headaches you don't need to worry about this as well as QLDB is serverless and it automatically scales as per your requirement and as with other AWS services here as well with QLDB you pay only for what you use so that's something wonderful isn't it so this is a simple explanation about QLDB but I just mentioned the journal isn't it so let's talk about what a journal is with respect to QLDB so when we think of a journal in our daily life it is like a record or daily record of news and events of a personal nature so this is to keep track of the events and if you see there is a sequence to this so every event that gets registered is sequentially updated on the journal and that is what you need to keep in mind so day one i drove my bike after 12 days day two i gave 1500 rupees and day three i lent 500 more day four i went out for shopping for 2000 day five i went for a drive that cost me around 5000 i got back 200 that i had given someone and on day seven david had asked me to meet him so it is like a record for all the events that take place in my life but it is of a sequential nature and all of them can be recorded and can be backtracked to what the event was based on the day it was entered into the journal so if this journal has your data then can we say that a journal is a database hmm. let's check that out so when you are working with databases you add entries isn't it so let's say each change whatever it is in your CRUD operation as a transaction and that is what helps you to maintain the asset properties so your transactions are the core of your database operations isn't it and this immutable transaction log that you have on QLDB is called the journal so I know you might have many doubts on ledgers and journals so keep watching and let's talk more about this so one thing you should have or one thing you should always keep in mind that the history of changes to your data on QLDB is immutable which means it cannot be altered, updated or deleted. So how do we achieve this using the journal or ledger? So in QLDB when you write the data or perform the operation it is append only and every block of data that you have is a sequence of hash chained sets of blocks. I'll repeat that once again it is append only and every block of data that you have is a sequence of hash changed sets of blocks so you might be thinking what is a hash changed set don't worry we will talk about that so this is your client and the application that you have connects to the ledger to run the transaction like insert update or delete so let's add the first transaction of insert for phones so here we have stored id product model reference number and owner and the metadata of date and time when the transaction took place which is written in sequence to the journal that is j here so j denotes the journal here and next what happens here is that the data is captured or in database term materialized into the table with view by which you can query the current state of the transaction that is represented by c here that is c here which represents the current state of the transaction this also appears to be captured as a part of the historical transaction that is represented by H here. So historical transaction is represented by H. Let's add another update transaction. So where we are changing the owner's name of the product from Sam to Josh Doe. So here you can see in the historical table, we have a column called version with a version number. Now if you see the current state changes and has changed and the history has added a new entry with a new the version number and each transaction is a sequence here transactions are committed to the journal as blocks that are hash changed for verification let's add the last entry here 
where we have a delete operation so here if you see the current state before delete remains the same but the history has been updated with version 3 for the deleted entry this is how the ledger keeps track of changes and you can create journals to keep track of your transactions and by using streams we can send each revision in real time to amazon kinesis data streams for further processing but you must be thinking okay we have the logs that are secure and sequential but what exactly is that which makes it immutable so let's check that out so the first thing that you need to always remember is that there are no apis or other methods to alter any committed data in place so if you can't alter the data then it is obvious that you can query the full history of the ledger so that's a very important point so there are no apis or methods to alter any committed data in place in qldb so if you can't alter the data then it is obvious that you can query the full history of the ledger so each block that you have here represents the operation object that your data is about like insert update and delete so in order to protect the overall accuracy completeness and consistency of data we have to sequence them and chain hash them so that we can verify the authenticity of the data so here each block has a sequence which also acts like an address for the sequence for every transaction and there is a hash chain like this 310 311 312 313 314 and this is a sequence number whenever you make any operation it gets appended to that okay so a lot has been said about hash chaining let's see what it is about so we already know that journal blocks are sequential with a sequence number and are chain hashed together with a cryptographic hashing technique so yes similar to the blockchain technique i know so here we are using sha256 hashing to generate the digest or hash value in such a way that every step of time you can validate the digest to ensure that your data is verified and is authentic so if we expand a block you can see the actual components present in the block so here you have the data the metadata of your data entry and the particle statement that you have executed for the transaction processing and here amazon qldb supports a subset of the particle query language by which you can create your transactions so amazon ion document that you see here is an abstract data model that uh, lets you store both structured and unstructured data and is a superset of json so superset in the sense if you have a valid json document it can also be called as an amazon ion document so it's simple as that and along with these three you have a block hash that you see and i'm sure you might be aware of how encryption or hash functions work so we won't go much deep into that you can check out my videos on kms that has some details on this but i am not still satisfied of how this block works or how the hash chaining works so let's dig more deep into this i'm sure you also want to and before moving forward i just want to reiterate that we are using sha56 hashing to generate the digest or hash value in such a way that every step of time you can validate the digest to ensure your data is verified and is authentic so now we are good to go so as i've already mentioned before the integrity of the data is its accuracy and consistency over its life cycle like when it was inserted or when it was updated and finally when it gets deleted so throughout its life cycle and you know that a ledger has a journal and in that you have your immutable transaction logs which we discussed a few minutes back and this immutability aspect of the transaction logs and this statement holds true under these two conditions the first condition is it exists at the same location in your journal where it was first written based on the document revision history that you want that you have that you can translate to and it hasn't been altered in any way since it was written so it doesn't mean that it should be updated it's about the data altercation also so these two statements are the underlining conditions where the statement actually holds true where it where we say that we have the immutable transaction logs so please keep in mind these two statements that first statement is it exists at the same location in your journal when it was first written and the second one is it hasn't been altered in any way since it was written okay so the position and the data that it has should be authentic and the integrity of the data should not be altered and when we talk about data integrity there are four basic components of verification so the first one is hashing the second one is digest 
the third one is merkle tree and the last one is proof we will discuss them one by one so when it comes to hashing you have to understand in cryptography when you are using a hashing function algorithm here we are using sha256 as i already told you which produces a 256 bit 32 byte hash value hexadecimal number of 64 digits so the value that the hash function returns is the hash value or it is also called as the digest that is the output that you generate so in the first step we create the hash value with a fixed size using the sha256 hash function and even if you change a single digit the hash value changes that is what you see in the second step so if we change the name of owner from sam to josh to the hash value also changes but you have to understand that you can convert a input to hash value but it's not the other way around so if you have an output it's not mathematically feasible or possible to compute the input when you provide a output yes seriously you cannot it's not mathematically feasible to compute the input when given an output now let's talk about what is a message digest so a message digest is a fixed size numeric representation of a content of the message computed by a hash function so it's simple as that so it is a fixed size numeric representation of the contents of a message computed by a hash function so which we just discussed now and message digest can be encrypted forming a digital signature which will be used to validate the authenticity and integrity of a message so let's bring the input that is the data that you have and then by using a hash function like sha256 we can create the hash value so if the input is 12311123 by using a sha256 hashing algorithm i can compute the cryptographic value for that one and that will be my message digest so i hope you got this now let's understand how do we actually verify the data integrity using merkle proofs so before understanding merkle audit proof let's go through a very important concept that is of hash chaining we all by now understand that hash chaining is used for cryptographic verification of the integrity of the data so let's suppose this is your data or this is our data and its sequence is a b c and d next when we use our hashing to create our hash chain that is it becomes h of a h of p h of c and h of d to keep it secure we can create a root hash by combining all these hash values let's see so this is how we are combining all the hash values and creating a root hash and then by using the hash function we create the root hash and store it on our trusted servers so once you have the all the hash values you can combine them and you can keep the root hash value that is h of a b c d in the trusted server that you have so next if you want to verify this so for a verification you know that each hash value can collect the hash values of other blocks and compute its own hash and create a root hash and compare it with the one that is present on the trusted server to ensure the data that we have is valid so this is the whole idea so you create the root hash and once you have created the root hash and you have stored it in your trusted server you can compute the other blocks that you have for the root hash value by using one of the computed blocks and you can compare the one that has already existed on the trusted server with the one that you have and thus you can validate the data that you have so this is a general idea but what if the server gets compromised and you get a compromised response so in a way you will not find the root hash on the server so how do we solve this problem so is there a way for the server itself to prove that it has the correct data so i'm asking you this question again so is there a way for the server itself to prove that it has the correct data yes there is so here is our current setup and now here what we can do is we can store the root hash along with the blocked hashes or the block hashes together on the trusted server so this might be a costly affair but we will eventually have the proof that the server has the correct data so for its verification what the server might tell you that i have all the block hashes and by using these we can compute a node hash so by using ha and hb we can compute hab so by using ha and hb i can compute hab by using hc and hd i can compute hcd and now we have the leaf nodes hab and hcd and then using this leaf nodes we can compute the root hash that is habcd so if this actually matches the one that you have then your data is secure and you have the authentic data 
on your server but if any of these values get changed so if this becomes h a and h d then you will not be able to compute h a b and thus you will not be able to compute the root hash that is h a b c d which is already present on the trusted server so i hope you got the point here and that's where we are ready to understand merkle audit proof so now we have reached a point where we need to understand merkle audit proof and if you are hearing this concept for the first time don't worry it's simple you are already on your way to teach others what is merkle audit proof so let's read these lines that we have here so a merkle audit proof lets you verify that a specific certificate has been included in a log and this is a critical verification task because the certificate transparency model demands that all tls clients reject any certificate that do not show up in the certificate log so i hope you read this carefully so what it is trying to tell is that we have a certificate and we need proof that it is present in the certificate log and if it is present then we can say that this is a valid certificate else we can reject that certificate so this merkle audit proof is just a concept that helps us to identify whether the data that we have is authentic or not so the process to find the proof is provided by the merkle audit proof with the help of merkle tree yes so the process to find the proof is provided by the merkle audit proof with the help of the merkle tree so i'm not sure if you <laughs> understand merkle tree but that's what we are going to learn today so don't worry so what i want you to do is replace the certificate here to block and you will get the answer on how merkle audit proof is being applied in qldb so let's suppose this is our root hash that is merkle tree hash as i told you the example that i showed you before just try to relate to that and try to replace the certificate here to block and what i want you to do is replace the certificate that word that you are thinking here right now to block and you will get the answer on how merkle audit proof is being applied in qldb okay so let's suppose this is our root hash that is the merkle tree hash then we have the node hash then we have the leaf hash and then we have the certificates okay so the first thing that we have is the root hash then we have the node hash then we have the leaf hash and then we have the certificates so let's suppose you have a certificate d3 and you want to validate its authenticity from the trusted server okay so that is what we are going to do we are going to audit proof for this certificate so you ask the server to provide the proof so what the server does is that it sends the appropriate hashes as proofs so it will try to send you the proofs but don't think now about what basis the server sends the proof we'll discuss that so here we have three nodes i c and n i c and n so here we have three nodes that is i c and n and using these we have to compute the root hash and if we are able to do that we can conclude that our audit trail is successful so now that you have d and the server has given you c what you can do is we can compute j by using cd and as we know j and as we know i we can compute m and as we know m and n from the server we can compute the root hash and then we can compare the compute of h d c j i m n is equal to the root hash or not with the original root and validate it okay so this is how merkle audit proof actually works so let's reiterate on this once again so now that you know d the server has given you c so you can compute j using c and d and as i know as we know already that we have i and j then we can compute m and as i already know n i can compute the root hash that is d c j i m n and that will be my root hash and then we can compute the and then we can compare the compute of h d c j i m n with the original root and validate it so if it is correct then the certificate that you have is valid else it is not valid and now you know why qldb is so popular because it follows so many principles just to verify and make your data accurate for you okay so now let's talk about particle database so the query language that qldb prefers is particle which is like sql but this has been provisioned to work with ion documents so let's see some of the similarities and differences between both relational and qldb 
So in your relational database, we have the database, the table, index, table row and columns. And when it comes to QLDB, the database here is the ledger. We have the table view, we have the index and the table row becomes Amazon Ion document, which we actually provide as our data. And the column in relational database is document attribute here on QLDB, where it's the document ID to each document that we insert. So the query language for the relational database is SQL and for QLDB is particle, which is an open source SQL compatible query language to work with ions. And the audit logs that you have on relational database are the journals here on QLDB, which we have already discussed before. So I hope you got the idea of the similarities and the differences here. Let's move on. Now let's quickly talk about the architecture which you would have no doubts about understanding now. So you have your application data that gets connected to the QLDB within which you have the current state and the historical data and the table view. And along with that, you have the immutable transaction log that is the journals. From the current state, you can query for the complete history of the data that you have and the changes that have been made on the data itself. Similarly, using the journal, you can cryptographically verify the integrity of the revisions made on the data that you have. Simple, isn't it? Now let's talk about some of the benefits and recap on the things that we love about QLDB. So the first one is immutable and transparent. Every data that you push is stored as a block and is kept as a part of an immutable log that is a journal. And that is what helps QLDB to maintain a complete and sequenced history of changes over time. Second one is cryptographically verifiable. For data integrity and verification, QLDB uses a cryptographic hash function, SHA-256 or SHA-256 to generate a secure output file of your data's change history known as the digest which we already discussed and remember this, it will be very important. So when it comes to performance and scalability, Amazon QLDB is highly scalable and can execute two to three times as many transactions as ledgers compared to the common blockchain frameworks. So this is because blockchains are decentralized, which means that you're not logically connected and they may not be on the same communication network. So to get the majority, it will take time. But QLDB is centralized. So you don't need a consensus or majority to agree for the transaction to take place. So it's faster than other blockchain techniques. Next one is serverless. So you don't have to worry about scaling or provisioning resources when your demand increases. So that's a good thing. And the other one is QLDB is highly available. So you get your data replicated within and across availability zones within the region for your data to be highly available and that too without any additional cost. Moving on to the last one, ease of use or usage. So as we already discussed, QLDB supports Particle, a new open source SQL compatible query language designed to easily work with all data types and data structures. Why are they saying this is because considering the fact that Particle is SQL compatible, you will find it easier to mold yourself to use this. And it's based on Amazon Ion, which is a subset of JSON. So it will be more familiar for the developers and the designers to use. So let's talk about some of the use cases of QLDB. So the first one is finance. So ledgers are very important or very much important when it comes to banking transactions where the authenticity of transaction is the core. For example, a bank has various divisions like debit and credit and loan and each transaction that takes place has to be tracked in a way that it can prevent it from being manipulated. So in finance, it can help the companies to have a better system in place. The second one is human resource. So when you talk to your HR, it's not just about the salary of the employee. There is more to what the HR department has to deal with in terms of data related to the employee. It might be payroll, the bonus, the benefits, performance history, insurance, exit formalities, enrollment, and all that is a set process. And QLDB can help retain and maintain data in a way that it provides conclusive evidence of the state of the employee at any given time. The third one is insurance. So as we know, insurance data is very complex, starting from the inception of taking the policy to having the historical data of the claims related to the insurance. More than that, insurance also deals with second or third party beneficiaries, which amount to a lot of data that has to be taken care of with respect to the life cycle. So here the cryptographic verification helps insurance companies to validate the data and its state at a given point of time. Next one is retail and supply chain. So retail and supply chain is a process oriented business model 
which starts from inventory to sales to delivery and logistic. So QLDB helps supply chains to track down the historical data of the changes that take place in the process chain accurately. So last one that we have here is manufacturing. So just like the supply chain here as well, manufacturing is somewhere you need a provision to track the progress and historical data of your production chain. So QLDB can help easily track the history of the entire production and distribution life cycle of that product. So now you know why this is called as quantum ledger. So a transaction can be in one of many possible states. Which one is unknown until fixed by observation. So starting from the immutability aspect of the journal to the cryptographic validation of your data block, this is something that makes it easy for you to track the data and its state at a particular given point of time. And that is why the name is quantum.